And the first, my first degree I earned from Sophie Newton College in New Orleans, it was the women's school at Tulane University prior to Hurricane Katrina. So many years later, I decided I needed to go back to school and I chose Online Academy, a more academic school. In, and in 98, I enrolled in their continuing education program. Um, within the first week of school, I realized that in order to make the most of that kind of school, get the best education I could, I really needed to join their full BFA degree um, program that culminated in doing the um, senior class thesis project. So to make a long story short, um, in 2002, I graduated as one of five students. Um, and it was a ride, it was wonderful, very challenging. The Academy did two major things for me. Um, amongst other things, but the first was to allow me to mature on a personal level while giving me, um, by teaching me discipline and then allowing me to learn how to apply that discipline to my artwork. And the second, the second thing was, you know, it just opened a door to what I consider as being a perfectly glorious career. And it really has been a ride. It's been wonderful. So while we were here studying, we all called ourselves, very loosely called ourselves, formalists. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> Looking at Susan. Um, formalists deal very directly with the formal issues and elements of painting. And many years after I graduated, and then became a teacher myself, I simplified my um, group of elements down into four categories. The first was composition. And to me, that is the invention. It's the art artistic part of what we do. It's, it's the, the artist's language. What do they want to get across to their viewer? The second is drawing skills. Has the artist been convincing in terms of portraying their subject matter? The third is color, light, and value. If you don't have light, you can't see color, and there's no value, which is the lights and darks, so you only see dark. And the fourth is surface. What are you doing with your paint? What are you doing with your surface? Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it transparent? Is it opaque? So we, t we were taught to take all of these elements and through a primary palette, not limited, but a palette with one blue, one red, and one yellow, and of course white, we were taught to paint. And the primary palette will, we use the primary palette to maintain a balance and harmony in our work. The year I after I graduated was an extraordinarily difficult year for me. And this was just because I kept hearing my, voice, my teacher's voices. You guys were still telling me what to do, how to do it, when to do it. And I, I began to realize that I didn't know who I was as a painter. Um, and I realized that I needed to discover my language and become myself in my art while using all those skills that we had learned. And this is what I did. This is about a year later from graduating. I stopped painting for a very short amount of time. And I went driving, and if driving in search of new subject matter, I was really stuck on subject matter. And after about a week's time trying to find new subject matter, I remember stopping at a public landing very close to where I live now, in a very beautiful part of the world on Buzzard's Bay, and I just sat there frustrated in my car. Um, and eventually, I looked up through the windshield, 
and saw something kind of like this. It's a trailer park, right on beautiful Buzzard Bay in South Sudan. And I have to tell you, it's essentially the kind of place that I was taught to not like so much. But now I saw it not for its content, but for how I could use what I saw to paint with the skills that I had learned. This was perfectly ordinary and public material that I could use to address all kinds of nuances using the elements of painting. So now I could experiment with different canvas sizes, compositions, all, all different kinds of things, you name it. And I also felt that by painting subject matter that anybody could happen upon, would allow my viewer to connect in his or her own way to what I was painting. And no longer did I need, did I feel the need to paint beautiful things in order to, to carry my work. So the very next day I went out and I started painting what has become a very, very large ongoing series of work. This particular painting is called The Getaway. Obviously, it's much smaller than what you see here, but it's not the first painting I painted there. Um, the first painting I painted was called A Gray Day, because it was a gray day. And that I sent out to Cleveland. And unfortunately, at the time, I hadn't been using digital cameras, so I couldn't have to work on that. But this is a fairly sleepy side view of campers. And I wanted most of my energy in the painting to come from the thick and thin paint. Um, and also the chaos of the telephone line. See, you can check out my, my paintings here and, and look at the surface a little bit better. So moving on in the series, this painting is called Staccato. It's 60 inches wide. And I like to use, um, I like to do multi-paneled paintings. So this is three square panels put together. It's a late day scene with a car driving almost head on to address the viewer. It's a sliver of light that hints to a much larger world. And cars, um, I paint cars quite often. Um, I like them. They, they, they're almost human at times. And they can be very conversational, especially if they're driving right at you. So this is a personal interpretation of a scene that is meant to give the viewer a sense of place. A sense of place. This next painting is called Sun Up. It's a smaller painting for me. It's about 24 by 36 inches. This painting is vacant of movement. And my intent was to give the scene a sense of big space at land's end. In architecture, folks are always addressing size, mass, and scale. And this, can, this also applies to painting and can be used to create tremendous tension and feeling. One of the things that I really love to do is to break the rules of painting and composition. Such as, don't ever cut your picture plain in half. <laughs> I will do this quite a bit by placing my horizon line right dead smack in the middle of the page. And then I'll use various elements to pull the tension around, such as the wires um, and the stripe in the middle of the, of the road to offset the awkwardness of the division. Now, another thing that I'll do is, as you can tell, it looks like the painter's been standing right in the middle of the road. 
I like to take my entire mood and, and pull it over. So I'm always skewing the perspective in my paintings. So here, the painting is not only divided horizontally, but it is vertically as well. So I'm doing these things all the while, and to quote David Dewey, I'm trying to find it's extraordinary in the ordinary. I'm trying to find something interesting in not a whole lot of anything. And now that I mentioned David Dewey, I'd like to talk a little bit about my influences. And so this image here is now also in this image. Sun up. I get asked to participate in really wonderful projects. And for this exhibit, I got to exhibit with David Dewey, who was at the Newport Art Museum, in their mentors and their students exhibit. It was a few years back, uh, maybe five or so years ago. So those who have influenced me the most are all of my teachers, all of the students that I was studying with, I paid attention, I watched everybody. And so, Dewey, Sheehan, Zellinger, Geno, Weiss, Eshelman, Stevenson, Gladwell, and of course, dear Dean Keller, these are my main influences. And also, the people that they suggested that we study. Um, folks like Porter, Hopper, Sergeant Soroya, Zorn, the Old Masters, even Corn in the California School, and then I myself collected a whole bunch of artists, artists that I really referred to along the way. The list goes on, and it's really quite endless. This next painting is called Fall. It's a small, very small painting of, yes, an airstream. Um, so in a way, this is this is um, a series within a series. And what really appeals to me about painting essentially the same subject over and over again is that the artist can really dig in and explore their medium without getting bogged down by constantly seeking out fresh subject matter. And I will, I will paint my subject matter from all sides, top, bottom, all directions, all angles. And it allows my work to become more about the actual process of painting, the actuality of the process. This painting is also <coughs> in the corner. It looks huge here. Wow. Um, it's called Staying In. About 36 inches wide. I'm, I think that's about 10, 10 inches tall. Every single part of my paintings are important. Um, in fact, I frame my work to a quarter of an inch outside the canvases to maintain the ability to see those edges. And again, this was another element that we learned in materials and techniques class. I think that, that was a year-long class, or was it two years? I forget. It was very informational. This <clears throat> Shacks. This is a very small painting painted on linen. Um, it's a backlist, and I'd like to talk a little bit about negative space. I don't know if any of you have met Stephen Sheehan. I know some of you will remember him from class, etc. Stephen was constantly encouraging us to eliminate the predictable from the work and to try to get the viewer to really question what a painter has done um, with, with their paint. To address this idea, I will often pay more attention to the negative space in my paintings um, by using thicker paint or greater contrast to define the positive, tangible areas. 
it took me quite a while to see my subject matter as all parts important. In other words, the tangible telephone pole at first was far more in important to me than the intangible sky. That's where it gets a little tricky. When you think about it, we all see things three-dimensional. I'm looking at you, you're all at different depths. It's three-dimensional. So an artist needs to take the three-dimensional, rearrange it onto a two-dimensional surface, such a way that it looks three-dimensional all over again. I think herein lies the whole um, abstraction of painting. And it is through this process that makes all parts of a painting important. So when I have a brand new class to teach, I hand everybody an infant's toy. And I tell them that when we first come into this world, our parents do everything that they can in order to engage us into our new environment. And they give us toys that we can hear, see, feel, taste, you name it. But never once do they say, okay, Dora, regard the toy, but also regard the environment in and around it. And in painting, that's what you really need to do. So I make them put these in their uh, paint boxes, and anytime they run into trouble, you know, I tell them, regard the toy, because maybe you're not looking at the negative space, the environment. And it's when an artist can successfully turn the cards on convention and make a sky, for instance, come jumping forward through telephone lines in such a way that it will challenge the viewer. This is called Small Shack. Pieces of paint. Pieces of paint. Susan, David, Stephen, Nancy, the whole crew were constantly trying to get us to think about pieces of paint or the right size bit of paint, placed in the right place, with the right color, and at the right value. And if you get all this, you technically should get a right painting. I don't know. <laughs> Something to work from in place. This technique prevented the chalky deadness that can come with over on your on your canvas. And it will, um, help the artist from becoming too detailed in the beginning of their work. Again, pieces of paint. This is called Red Truck, another smaller painting on panel. All of my paintings are started with two values, one light and one dark. I squint hard and eliminate all but the light patterns to remain showing in what I see, and then I paint that. And then from there, I'll go back in with other values, start with some color, I'll take paint off, it's, and put paint on, it's just a constant, constant process. This is a larger painting. It's 54 by 32 inches. And here is where all those watercolor classes I took with David Dewey um, really influenced my work. Thin paint and washes show atmosphere and allow the eye to continue on through, through the work. Opaque paint stops the eye. So again, in contradicting convention, I will put opaque paint in the, in the sky where you would expect it to see on into infinity and keep my thinner layers in the, um, in the closest areas to me.
painting is called Cell. To give you, it's it's I think this was about 28 by 28 inches. I continue to build and prepare all of my canvases and panels. This way, I can build them for my subject matter. Also, I can just, for me, I can just build a better surface. It's a little tighter, sort of like a tram, uh, tambourine. And square paintings will give you a circular energy. Horizontal paintings are more relaxed. They hug the earth. Vertical paintings have to fight gravity and are far more energized. And again, I'll use these according to the ideas and um, the ideas that I wish to paint. The wall. This is a really small painting. Um, I painted it in my car. Uh, to be honest with you, I can't do that too often because the thinners will make me a little dizzy after a while. But I personally find it really hard to paint a truly beautiful place that doesn't have these man-made objects in it. It's just impossible for me to find anything that I can improve upon in a large, sweeping, unspoiled landscape. And so much of my process really depends on painting many small areas, all at different depths. So again, I'm choosing my subject matter for how I wish to paint. What, what my subject matter will allow me to do. <coughs> this painting is called End. It's a somewhat larger painting from the, uh, the last image. It's painted on linen. Linen is more porous, so absorbs. Panel is far less absorbent, so the paint tends to sit right up on the top of the surface. This is of the same subject matter as the last painting, last image, and refers, refers to the sign all the way to the right that says dead end. This was painted several years later. So again, working in series allows me to paint at all times of the day and all times of the year. And it just allows me to experiment with light and how it affects pattern and composition. This painting is called Wooden Birds. Wooden birds because in the winter when there's nothing hanging on the lines, the wind shakes the, the clothes pins and they always look like wooden birds. And now I really want to talk about white objects and white paint. White itself is not a color. It's not a color at all. Rather, it's a vehicle that takes on color. It reflects color. And it needs to do two things. It needs to read as color. And it needs to extend the lights and darks, or the value in painting. So what this means is that if a painter were to just plain put white paint on a canvas, likely it would look like spilled paint. It would look out of place. White is also opaque, so it stops the eye. And the only primary color that it intensifies is blue. When you add white to red or yellow, those colors dull. So white really acts like a blue agent. 
And because of all this, I personally don't use any white in my, in my paintings at all until I have the composition and patterning and the lights and darks completely established. This will also allow my initial layers to remain as unpolluted, that's what I call it, um, layers in my painting. So in this particular painting, the white towels are not painted pure white, but take on all the colors around them. And the telephone poles are painted with two or three thinner washes of only primary mixed paints. That's it. So again, I'm really trying to, to discover the, the limits of my paint, see, see what I can do with it. This painting is called I Go Walking. This is one of my very large paintings. Um, I love painting large It's because it's just so hard to settle the composition. It takes a long time. Um, and any paint that you have on the painting, you better be sure that you really want it there or it will cure. And then then if, if you don't want it there in the future, then it, you can't get the transparency back. This is a self-portrait that actually um, exhibited here a few years ago. I, 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 the years are sliding by, I forget exactly when. Um, it's in the same series as the last, um, the last image, but painted several years later. And this is one of my more narratives. And he knows that it is of Little Compton. Um, I came here all the time, all the time. Uh, and it's a scene of the old world part of town where people still hang their laundry up and kids ride down to the beach, pop their bikes up without having to lock them. Um, and it's a very late spring day, very cool day. So while we were here at the Academy, um, hue, value, and intensity were often addressed together in a group. And it was suggested that the student knock down one or two of these elements to keep their work from overpowering their viewer. In other words, a painting with many high intensity colors and with tremendous contrast all together could become too predictable. It could dictate too much to the viewer. So in my paintings, I try to knock down the intensity and I'll often limit the amount of colors that I have that I'm using. So I will use more analogous colors, or three colors next to each other um, on the color wheel. Often it's a primary color with the two secondary colors showing. This next painting is called Confidant. 36 by 36 inches. In terms of drawing, it is most important to me that I capture gesture over detail. And I think that gesture has everything to do with structure and form. It goes right back to the idea of formalism, structure over content. And in this painting, it was important to me that I got the figures just right eased back, relaxed, enjoying an intimate, intimate com uh, conversation on a day off at the shore. And figures will give a sense of scale to a scene. And since they, since they are what the viewer can most readily identify with, 
absolutely after all we're all human figures and when you see a figure that's what you can identify with the most these figures really need to be painted as part of the environment and as we learned here a figure in space a figure in space and it goes right back to the idea of the radar all parts important Ride. This is um, 16 by 16 inches painted on panel. By now, you probably noticed that I like simple titles. And I'm really doing one of two things. I'm either drawing attention to the obvious, or I'll try to draw attention to a very small detail that I think maybe the viewer would miss. But I don't entirely call myself a plein air painter, even though our, our education here was completely from life. <coughs> My work is all painted from small studies, <coughs> drawings, and informational photos. All this information is my own, and that's really important because I think that if artists are using somebody else's <coughs> image, for instance, they're not inventing they're not coming up with the artistic part. Um, and so everything has to be original to me. It's my own. Um, every painting is either started on location, from life study, from a smaller work, or from a small sketch collage with photo reference. But at least 50% of most every painting that I, I work on is worked on in my studio using absolutely no reference at all. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to paint for the sake of the painting, and again, not the subject matter. In the case of this painting called Ride, I felt that I needed a figure to add movement. And I found an image I had taken of my husband and I snuck it into the composition. And to me, it added movement. And the hardest thing about doing that is that you have an image, and then you have a painting. Now you have to get the scale right. Um, you really have to work to get the scale right. And in terms of cars, sometimes I will walk up to my car and see where it fits me. And then I'll, I'll paint a figure next to the car and have the right height. This next painting is called Walking the Dog. It's another small painting. Because of all the life drawing classes that I took here, I can now invent figures. Those classes taught me the formulas for the human form. In painting this painting, I observed a woman walking her dog on location, and I wanted to replicate it in the studio. Um, I remembered Dean Keller in class flexing body parts in demonstrations to show us how the body worked. And I worked that to get the action of this woman resisting her pet's pull. Again, an effort to um, add movement to my hands. <clears throat> this is called Newbury. I painted it right on Newbury Street. I do still do plein air painting at times. When I go away, I will bring my paint box and I'll paint my world around me as a, as a visual journal. Um, and life painting really helps me to make spontaneity in my work. It keeps me painting so fast while I'm trying to paint structure, especially if that structure is moving. And 
So I'll paint a figure. If I don't like it, I'll scratch it out and I'll paint another one and I'll keep working until I get, get what I want. And I have family in the Netherlands um, and I have painted the farms and villages around where they live um, and have amassed kind of a very large uh, personal portfolio. I brought one of the paintings over um, to show you. It's in the corner. This next painting is called Highway. <clears throat> this is a larger painting. It's 44 by 54 inches. This is a, the new bridge over the Providence River. And to be honest, it was a total challenge in terms of perspective. Um, I have saved, I saved all the notes that I took in Peter Salinger's class. <laughs> Very important. And um, I can't tell you how many paintings I have hung up on the big wall in my studio with tacks and a lot of string, a lot of string going from the points of distance and the vanishing points to the interior of the painting. Um, I really think it works. It's all in order to get the perspectives uh, straight and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's worked. I'm hoping it works. It's really saved my time on my paintings. That's what I did here. The Hyatt painted in Newport, Rhode Island. 36 by 48 inches. This was actually painted from a smaller study. I consider my work as being very particular painting, which is really like most of my other work, in spite of the different subject matter. Um, I'm using a lot of line, color, and value to establish this, this structure. And these are all elements of painting. Um, objects fuse into one another and are cut off, hinting to a much larger world beyond them. So again, I am choosing that subject matter for how I can work with composition and the elements of painting. How I can allow that sky to come through. And through the years, you know, I've, I've been asked so many times to submit an artist statement. And I now have this very lengthy artist statement. Hmm. But really, all I need is just the first statement, and it's five words. My work is about paint. And that's it. It's about paint and what you can do with it. <laughs> This painting is called River. Very large painting. It's 48 by 72 inches. It's a largely imagined painting that I started I, from, a, from a sketch painted on a piece of a cardboard box. I went outside with a piece of cardboard and my paints and I sketch this out. Um, in places, there's very little paint, very thin washes, that, for instance, in the grass. In other places, there's really thick paint that I put on with a knife. And compositionally, I added pieces and not objects. Pieces and not objects. Um, I just kept putting paint on and scraping it off putting it on, stripping it off, and putting it on again until I arrived at what you see here. And at the end of the day, I consider this as being a real studio paint, done completely in the studio. So I'm gonna um, shift gears a little bit here. This is called the pendant. 
It's 34. The original painting is 34 by 34 inches. And the one academy I'm a little bit envious has a wonderful illust illustration department now. Um, maybe I'm going to have to come back for classes. We'll see. Um, but I personally think that illustration historically has been given a bit of a bad rap. I think it's been put second to painting or, or some other forms of artwork. Some of my absolute favorite painters, um, Maynard Dixon, Edward Hopper, N.C. Wyatt, and Frederick Remington, are folks whose work I look to all the time. As I said, we were, it was suggested that we look at other people's work and to collect books for reference uh, to our work. And so I've collected books on all these people. And for this particular painting, I used a painting by Frederick Remington called Coming to the Call. And I brought the book. Uh, the, the painting that I'm, I use is right on the cover. This book is also right there on the table. You can come up and look at it. And it was the Little Compton Historical Society in Little Compton, Rhode Island, that rallied together all of their local artists. And we were given moments in time to depict for this, to illustrate this book. <clears throat> My assignment was the Sakata Indians, pre-contact, fishing first thing in the morning off of Lloyd's Beach, a local beach, with their camp in the background. This is my interpretation. I had to do a lot of research for it. I had to figure out how they fished, what they, what these individuals would have worn, and what they lived in. Um, and then at the very end, I called it the pendant. I'm sorry. Um, I called it the pendant because at the age of eight, my father found a beautiful Native American pendant dark green argillite stone with a hole precisely drilled through the top of it. And the individual all the way to the left is wearing that. And I did this to add a little piece of reality to the painting. Anything else is imagined, but that added a little bit of reality. This painting is called Drum and Door. And this painting exhibited as one of 30 paintings at the New Bedford Whaling Museum um, in 2012. It's part of my series of the contemporary fishing fleet. Uh, New Bedford has, I believe, the largest fishing fleet in the country. And for me, as an artist, it offers endless compositional choices. It's just so exciting. And it was Sarah Cunningham of Walker Cunningham Fine Art who negotiated for me to have this exhibit um, at the museum. And she represented me until last year when she had to move her outfit to St. Louis. But the museum displayed um, this artwork all summer and into the fall. It was a real privilege. It was a lot of fun. So I include a few examples from this series to show the similarities to my street scenes. I again don't isolate objects, and I use line and color and surface to design the paintings. And I also make sure that there are a lot of different layers of depth to paint, from sky to the very closest things to me. This painting is called Steel. It's about 24 by 36. I painted this um, painting last summer. I think that each artist has their own way of arranging their composition, their own way of presenting their ideas to their viewer. And at this point, I feel that I choose how I want my work to look 
more and more intuitively. And as time goes on, and as I practice what I know about painting more and more, the process becomes far more automatic. And this is important. I feel that I've really um, found my way in painting, but I don't ever want to get too comfortable with my process. And I want to forge on. I strive to continue the process of discovery, always reaching out. Really important. And here I'm trying to become a little bit more abstract. Hopefully you have to think about what I'm painting here. And I'm going to leave you with this painting called Vessels. It's another one of my really big paintings. It's 40 by 68 inches. I think the largest painting I've ever done is, was about 10 feet wide. <clears throat> I want to look at two words. The first is interpretation. The work that I've shown you reflect my interpretation of the world around me and what I know about painting. And all of these paintings are very personal. I paint for my own hand. I paint for me. I do believe that each artist must be true to themselves and come up with their own thing in spite of their influences. So basically, pay attention to your, to your teachers, but then... The second word is evolve. Ultimately, artists like to experience evolution in their work. We need to evolve. And what we do is all about taking risks, pushing out further. Here's my latest risk. And it's just reflections. So perhaps this is the first time I've painted the tangible. It's water, I can touch it. But that represents something altogether different, something that I actually can't touch because it's just a reflection. It's my latest. You need to know that I came to the academy to learn graphic painting. Um, I am very excited about my education. And I actually, I miss the environment of school. I miss the learning, the camaraderie, um, fellow students, um, Phyllis Lynch, who was my classmate who left, who left us in October. Her husband was here earlier. Um, I, missed, I missed the whole thing. And on that note, thank you so much. And I really love answering questions. So if you've got questions for me, please go for it. Thank you so much.